Uh, this is uh, my fifth uh, all hands meeting uh, with you and we decided to uh, shake it up a little bit uh, to actually invert the conversation and respond to questions that members of the IANR community uh, shared with us. Uh, Jen Muller ran a survey, it was open, and we invited folks to, uh, to get with us. There were roughly about 20 questions, 25 questions. When you looked at the similarity in the questions, we got it down to about 12 to 14. Uh, we've decided to address uh, eight of those um, questions, if we can get through eight in the first 30 minutes with you. And to uh, move us along, and I didn't bring the clicker, Mike, sorry. Um, what we thought we would do is we would just ask a different member of the IANR senior leadership team to come up. They'll be given a handheld microphone and respond, tell you what the question was and respond. And we'll just take the first 30 minutes running that way. The second 30 minutes, uh, we are, boy, I was a little nervous. Some of my team last night told me that they were just going to zoom in. And, and I was to myself. And I see them walking in. Thank you, Ron and Chuck. Um, but uh, the, the next 30 minutes, I was so impressed by the presentation of our faculty and our unit leaders on our six communities on January 11th when Ronnie Green came to visit that uh, I think it's time that we uh, get our faculty in front of each other and share. And so this morning we're going to hear from the science literacy team, which covers all of our disciplines. And so uh, we'll hear from that team for the middle 30 minutes. And the last 30 minutes, then, I've got some information that I want to share with you. And then I saved two big, bold questions um, from, from you for the very end. And then, uh, then we'll, we'll drink some more coffee and, and get on with it. So with that, Archie Clutter, thanks. thought out my my mouth is at this point I just walked across uh, from Ag Hall well this is a question about the Eastern Nebraska Research and Extension Center and asking what impact <coughs> the development of that center will have on uh, research and teaching appointments in Lincoln and some of us are more familiar with NREC than others. So I think it's useful to step back and just talk a little bit about the origins of NREC. Ronnie Green, when he was vice chancellor, convened a task force in early 2014 of faculty and staff and a few external stakeholders to take a look at, to explore greater opportunities for greater coordination across our statewide resources. And that task force identified Eastern Nebraska as having the greatest opportunity, and they suggested that what was currently the Agricultural Research and Development Center near Mead, Nebraska, serve as a base for a new organization for Eastern Nebraska. ARDC um, was established in 1962. Some of us did our graduate work there. So it's been an important part of the system for a long time. Um, <clears throat> so there's a long history of research and integrated research and extension there, led primarily by faculty on the Lincoln campus. So guiding principles of this task force and this process have been to um, recognize that long history of excellence and to leverage it and to exploit opportunities for even greater integration across research extension and teaching to exploit opportunities for systems approaches that connect the cutting-edge research that's there through translation and production and to leverage the scale that's there from that fundamental research to the opportunity to do um, production scale work. And then finally, to leverage the connection of agriculture and agricultural production 
to the surrounding landscapes. So we took a big step forward last year when we hired Doug Zaleski into this role as director of the new Eastern Nebraska Research and Extension Center. Um, he's continued to work with a steering committee made up of the um, unit leaders of our 15 academic units across INR and CHS and the other r, &R &E Center directors. So the answer to the question, I think, is that from an East Campus perspective, there's an opportunity to leverage the great work that continues to go on there in these programs to, to enhance those existing programs, um, to be part of new projects. There's certainly going to be opportunities through the ideas and the innovation that emerge here to be part of new projects, to connect to students in new ways. So there's a lot of excitement around this, and I think it's, it's a great opportunity for faculty, staff on the Lincoln campus, and as well as other parts of the state. Well, good morning. Our next question focused on how INR is helping to improve graduate education. So just as a bit of background, last academic year through a holistic and inclusive process, we spent some time developing a collective vision and aligning a strategic framework around transforming graduate education in IANR. And the vision is that every graduate student is inspired and empowered to make a difference in a complex and diverse, in a diverse world. And this is a shared mission of the INR faculty and staff across ARD, Nebraska Extension, the College of Education, Human Sciences, CASNR, as well as INR Global Engagement. And I want to emphasize that um, we have really been proactive in this space, and as a result, um, the Institute is well positioned to be a leader here on campus around graduate education, as well as among our peer institutions. And um, if you look at this diagram, it outlines what those focus areas are around a holistic approach to connecting student interests to diverse career pathways, um, individualized experiences that are co-created by the learner, learning and experiences that transcend the campus footprint, integration across the learning experiences, broadening career pathways through exploration with partnerships, and then also ensuring that each of our graduate students have a professional development roadmap. So now that we have the framework created, we've moved into the second phase of this initiative, which focuses on developing these overarching strategies at the institute level that align with those goals. Secondly, partnering with the academic units to develop their strategic plans that will scaffold um, to this framework. And then thinking about what are those leading and lagging indicators that we'll be able to use to measure progress in achieving our overarching goals. A little bit about what we've been focusing on this academic year. First is to foster greater engagement and collaboration, and so we're doing that through a series of discussions with graduate chairs as well as um, roundtable dialogues for the graduate students. We're also thinking creatively about new credentials such as stackable certificates that align with learning outcomes that lead to a graduate degree interdisciplinary specializations, and also about professional development programming and experiential learning that can be credentialed through such things as digital badges. Other areas that we're exploring is innovative models around recruitment, professional development, and a couple that I will highlight here is we are working with the Office of Graduate Studies to develop these professional development programs around the input that was received from graduate students, from faculty, from staff, as well as employers and other stakeholders. And then what we're thinking about is how do we create opportunities, again, that we can credential that through these digital badges. We're also working with a team in the Institute to finalize a proposal um, that will be submitted this Friday. I'm looking at at Tala here, making sure we're on target for this Friday, um, that is going to position INR um, to hopefully be the um, site for hosting the second phase of the professional development program that's open to all um, graduate students across the U.S. through the FAR program, which is the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research program. We're also looking at innovative ways around internships, for example, more of these immersion experiences as opposed to a single 
simple one-time experience that may be for a longer period of time and how we can think strategically so that students can still keep focused on their coursework as well as their research but have these unique opportunities as well as funding to make sure that we're competitive and that was one aspect of this question and then how do we leverage these partnership opportunities so this is just a quick overview of where we are on the graduate education framework and at the bottom here we have a link the framework is available on the Kasner website and then we will also be working with the vice chancellor's office um, to add this link to the rest of the information that we post around the all hands meeting so thank you Well, good morning, everybody. Chuck Hibber, Dean and Director of Extension. Glad you all showed up on this chilly morning. We're testing the heating capabilities of the East Campus Union, and it's kind of going not so good right now from my perspective, but uh, here we go. Uh, so the question that uh, was posed that I'm responding to is about the, this idea of engagement zones or engagement centers. And uh, this is an idea that we've been thinking about for about eight or nine months. Uh, the idea is that instead of having five extension districts like we have now, we would have about 12 or so, we don't know the exact number, but that's a starting place, 12 engagement zones across Nebraska, okay? And there's really two reasons why this, uh, this idea is appealing or interesting to us. Uh, the first one is uh, related to the fact that right now, our research and extension center directors uh, supervise and manage not only the research and extension center, but then up to about 32 or 33 county offices and all of the staff in those county offices. So they are in a position right now where in some cases they are supervising, supervising 60 or 70 direct reports, which is a ridiculous idea. I did that job for 13 years. I know how ridiculous that idea is. It's a very, very hard job. So that's one piece. The second piece is that all of our research and extension center directors come from the faculty ranks rather than from county-based extension experiences. And so they don't have that direct experience with our county-based extension educators and assistants. So one of the ideas here is that we strengthen our supervision and management structure related to our county-based extension program. So that's one idea. The other big idea that I think is also really exciting, and you heard Ronnie Green talk about this last Tuesday at his all hands meeting, but this idea of community engagement, this idea really came from uh, work that the N150 Commission did, about 200 people from across these, uh, uh, this university. Uh, thinking about what does community engagement look like? Uh, how do we do that better? How do we engage, you know, extension does this every day? How do we engage beyond extension? And especially with many of our city campus colleagues. Many of them are already doing this at some level, but uh, we think there's an opportunity to really build capacity here. And so each one of these engagement zones would have a coordinator, Part of their job would be to work with uh, the county-based extension professionals, but the other part of their job would be to help build those uh, uh, relationships, those opportunities with uh, campus-based faculty, staff, students, and alumni, and do that push-pull idea that really helps people come from campus to communities and uh, for local community leaders to ask for what they want. And so uh, that's kind of the model, that's what we're thinking about. And I just close by saying this, when I came here in 1994 and one of the things we talked about relative to, to the county office was that the county office was the front door to the university. It's a nice idea, right? But the joke was sometimes you open the door and no one was there. So this idea might help us fix that so when we open that front door, someone is actually there. Thanks. Who's next? Ron Rosati. Ron. I'm Ron Rosati. I'm the Dean at the Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture, nice and I've been asked to uh, provide an update on um, partnership initiatives between NCTA and CASNR. So I've got four or five initiatives I'll provide a bit of update on. One is uh, an initiative for seamless transfer. So we now have nine articulation programs in place that allow students to uh, start at NCTA, finish their associate degree there, and then come to CASNR and graduate generally in four years from CASNR. So it facilitates 
course for course transfer from NCTA to CASNR that's in place. We have another transfer enhancement initiative in place. We have activities every semester for students at NCTA that would like to transfer to, uh, to CASNR to um, get them familiar with CASNR. Um, and uh, the last activity was last semester when 16 students from NCTA came to the big campus here. They spent the night on, on campus. They got to find their way around campus a little bit, got to meet a few people, and uh, they are uh, mostly intending to transfer uh, at the end of their sophomore year. There's an umbrella initiative that's been put in place uh, about this transfer uh, program. It's called the Link to Lincoln, and this allows students to be jointly enrolled at both campuses through inter-campus exchange. Uh, those students are also co-advised when they're at Curtis, they're co-advised by faculty at Kasner and, and faculty at Curtis. Another component of that transfer involves allowing students to take UNL credits while they're at the Curtis campus. So this is the pilot program that's been in place now for about a year. And with uh, coordination through the UNL uh, campus, we now have some students at the Curtis campus signing up for UNL courses while they're at Curtis, paying UNL tuition and getting UNL credit so when they transfer from Curtis to Lincoln, they take, uh, they'll have more credits to transfer when they make that move. And uh, we've been working on an enhanced reverse transfer agreement. This would be a pathway for students at Kasner to work towards both an associate degree and a bachelor's degree when they're at Lincoln. It would also allow students that uh, uh, leave Kasner before completing their bachelor's degree. It would provide them a pathway of getting an associate degree when they leave campus. This uh, model was developed about a year or so ago. We've gotten some feedback on it, and we're in the process of uh, revising uh, that reverse transfer model at this point in time. There's a number of other initiatives in place. They're very exciting. They've been very successful. We very much appreciate the partnership with Kasner, and we look forward to uh, growing that, that partnership. Good morning, Ron Yoder, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor in the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources. We received a question about faculty appointments, specifically calendar year appointments and academic year appointments, frequently referred to as 12-month appointments and nine-month appointments. We across the Institute have currently about a third of our tenure line faculty are in academic year appointments and that aligns well with almost all of the faculty on the city campus are academic year appointments what we found is we've been filling positions and I just tallied up the numbers here a week or so ago since we began our current process to hire tenure line faculty members in the beginning of 2012, we've hired about 166 faculty members. And we've begun, that third that I mentioned is because of that, because an increasing number of our new hires are academic year hires. And there are several reasons for this. One is that the market, to be competitive, we need to frequently, in certain disciplines, offer academic year appointments. And the other is that it does provide an opportunity for individuals in those appointments to augment their salary through external grant funding. So as we move forward, we've had conversations about what we will be doing going forward. And as we are currently in what I refer to as phase three of this, of our hiring since 2012, quite a number of those positions are academic year. As a matter of fact, the positions that we are now releasing, we ask that they be academic year unless there is a particular justification for a position to be 12 months. And that you may be thinking, well, what about extension? Well, Dean Hibbard has been part of these conversations. He has experience from his time at Purdue of how that might be handled. And I'm not prepared today to give any details because we we'll be talking with general counsel about what we're proposing for long term part of that will be 
likely an opportunity for individuals to change their appointment if they wish from the current calendar year, if that's what they have to a, an academic year appointment. But again, I, I'm not prepared to give details because we do want to vet our plans with uh, general counsel. What I would say in closing is that we're not going to require anyone who currently is in a calendar year appointment to change their appointment to an academic year appointment. So stay tuned. I would guess that we will work our way through this process over the next six to nine months. And I will pass the microphone to Beth Dahl. Thank you. So I have a similar question to Tiffany's, which is, what is happening in graduate education in the College of Education and Human Sciences? So let me, um, let me tell you five things that are happening that I think are pretty exciting. The first thing has to do with our faculty and faculty development, faculty support. Um, those of you that are, that are in the college know this, one in four of our students in College of Education and Human Sciences is a graduate student. And some of those are graduate students in professional programs that lead to a credential. Um, some of those are uh, graduate students in a doctoral program that builds scholarship and research credentials. And so one of the things we've really focused on in the last three years is building faculty um, skills in mentorship and um, problem solving. And so what are some of the unique demands of, um, of graduate teaching? Um, how do we handle um, mental health problems when they occur within our graduate students? What are the um, boundaries around faculty professional behavior? We're not doing these as a series of, of talks or expert lectures. Instead, we have routine um, graduate forum lunches, um, three or four a year. Graduate faculty are invited. Um, we usually get an audience of 30 to 40 graduate faculty. Um, and they, among themselves, will have a few references, resources. They create some principles, and those principles become part of the college website, just as notes from faculty to faculty. So that's, that's been an important piece of the college. We also have been spending quite a bit of time on diversity. Um, we have graduate student groups that are, are working with the college to promote not, um, not so much increased diversity, but more uh, cultural competence among the college. We also have a faculty and staff group. Um, the two groups together have really built the college goal around diversity in education and human sciences. Our focus right now is on um, how do you teach any course in any curriculum when you have a, a very different group of students than we perhaps had 20 or 30 years ago, um, how, do you, how do you teach with sensitivity, um, but also with, um, um, with the focus still being on the educational goals you need to achieve, how do you accomplish that with such a diverse community of students? And so, um, so in building that competence, one of the things that we are starting to bring in our speakers from around the country, um, March 13th, we will have Rupert Nacosti coming into the college um, from the um, North Carolina State University, um, well, well respected in his work on um, teaching in the new diversity on college campuses. So you all will be invited to that. You'll get a note about that. A third thing that we're really focusing on is our curriculum. Um, so we've, um, we've got in every department groups of faculty that are streamlining their curriculum, trying to, to ensure that each course moves seamlessly into the next, but they're also working on how do you connect that curriculum more tightly to the job market? What are the ways that they can do some seamless connections between um, fourth year of undergraduate and first year of graduate study? Um, and part of that is to um, both make those graduate degrees more functional so that students walk out of here and into a job. Part of it is really building um, what we see as a new support 
system for our students um, financially. That is, if, if our programs, um, in, in many cases, are connecting in with the jobs where community agencies or um, businesses need to employ them, then over time what we find is that our students actually have some um, financial support. Many times their second or third year of their graduate studies, they will be employed by those industries or agencies. Um, and so it not only moves them seamlessly into work, but it gives them an alternative source of financial support, that is those community partnerships. Um, we, we are trying mightily to raise foundation funds for graduate um, support. I know someone mentioned we should have competitive scholarships. There are a few, but there aren't enough for um, graduate student support. Um, but, but we think we're going to have to start looking in new ways, and that is to look at industry partnerships as um, another facet that can help us build some financial support for our graduate students. So that's what's happening in education and human sciences. Josh. Josh is next. And he'll be our last one. I was going to say. Thanks, Beth. Uh, good morning. My name is Josh Davis, uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement. And I was asked to share a little bit about the multiple roles that I'm currently playing on campus. So as most of you know, I've been in my current role for about four years uh, in INR, leading our global engagement efforts. And as of January 2nd of this year, I was asked to take on an additional role of interim associate vice chancellor for international engagement and global strategies, working across all of UNL. Uh, so for the last month or so, I've been playing both of those roles, um, effectively serving as the senior international officer for the whole campus. Uh, this role of senior international officer has really evolved in higher education over the last decade or so. As you all know, in this period of time, our world has become increasingly interconnected, which means all sorts of wonderful things, but all sorts of challenges come with that as well. And so a university like ours really has to be intentional, uh, has to be strategic about how we're navigating those challenges, about how we're engaging in the world and why. And so that's really become the role of a, the senior international officer on a university campus. And so uh, for this temporary period, um, wearing both of these hats, so to speak, I think is really a benefit. Uh, it'll help me uh, advise INR and the rest of UNL about how we can think creatively about advancing some of our global engagement initiatives, how we can build on some of the strengths that already exist. Um, for example, INR has really expanded its reach and impact over the last several years by building some international partnerships in key regions of the world. So our work in Rwanda, which is this picture here, our work in China, our work in Brazil. Can we use that network and some of the relationships that we've built to open doors for colleagues across UNL? Could those colleagues open some doors for us in places where we're maybe not working? I think the answer to both of those is probably yes. Um, when it comes to support for international students or international scholars, are we in INR getting all the support that we need? A lot of those support services exist on city campus. Maybe we can think creatively about how we can rethink some of that to make sure that everyone's getting what they need. And perhaps most importantly in my mind, um, can we at UNL create a vision for global engagement and some guiding principles that are broad enough that they include INR and business and arts and sciences and everyone else really so we have a shared vision of how we're trying to advance and, and create greater impact in the world. Um, I think that we can. I think that we must actually if we're going to navigate the complex world that we're operating in. And if, we, if we're going to guarantee that Nebraska always has a seat at the table when it comes to decision makers and scholars sitting down and thinking about how we're going to address some of the big challenges of the 21st century. I think that's essential that we have that seat. So that's how I've been spending my time. Uh, those are the two hats I'm currently wearing. I appreciate the chance to share just a little bit about that. If you're interested in learning more or becoming more directly involved in some of the work that we're doing, pr please reach out to me. Uh, I'd love to talk to you. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Very much, much appreciate uh, everybody's responses. So that was a good learning experiment for us. Uh, I'll answer a question before I kick the last 30 minutes, but I want to keep things moving and ask Jenny Keshwani uh, to come up and we'll jump right into our science literacy for those of you who um, 
maybe are new uh, back in 2010, 2011, 2012 discussions across the Institute about how we make impacts, uh, important impacts around the globe, starting with Nebraska, the, the Great Plains, uh, this country and beyond. And science literacy was one of those key areas. As I mentioned to you earlier, these were showcased on the 11th when Ronnie Green spent the day with us. I thought that was just excellent because it was on the eve of his State of the University address and not just any State of the University address but our 150th birthday and for him to re-immerse himself in what we do here in IENR. I just felt that was uh, excellent and I told him that. So Jenny, here you go and I'll start your clock now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Do I get the clicker? You should okay. have the clicker. <laughs> thank you. Um, if you spent any time on social media the past couple of days, you've probably seen a conversation about climate change and global warming and what's up with the polar vortex if it's so incredibly cold today. Um, and for us, it's easy to kind of get in our academic bubble and think, well, why aren't they just understanding this a little bit better? It's not as simple as you walk outside and it's warm because it's global warming. There's a lot going on there. Um, and that's really what the science literacy effort is kind of revolving around. So this idea that um, if I have a question about that, I can go across campus, maybe not today, to Hardin Hall and talk to somebody and figure out what, what is, what's going on here? What does this really mean? Um, for the general public, that's a little bit harder to do. They might not have those connections. Um, they might not know those people that they can talk to. Um, and as you think about this even more broadly, so I mean, global warming, climate change, climate variability is one thing, um, but what about GMOs? Is they safe for my family? What about vaccines? Is that a good idea? Um, what kind of energy should I use in my house? Should I use ethanol? Is that bad for my car? I mean, there's all these different questions um, and challenges that we're facing as society, and part of that um, comes down to producing these future STEM professionals, which is a big piece of this, right? And so this idea of someday we're going to have um, the second graders out there that are going to be grown-ups and professionals doing these really cool, innovative things, um, and really getting them on that pathway to do that um, at an early stage. But I think more importantly um, is developing a society that can handle these big questions. So how do you equip people to have these conversations, maybe on Twitter, um, in all walks of life to understand and really think about this in meaningful ways and have this um, STEM-informed analysis of these complex issues, which is really the focus of the Science Literacy Initiative. Um, so across um, the food, fuel, water, landscapes, and societal issues, how do we prepare people to have these big conversations, think about things um, in ways, not just give them the answers, not just give them the science content, but really prepare them to have these um, discussions amongst their friends, um, in community, to make policy decisions, to choose who they're going to vote for, what policies they're going to vote for, um, decisions they're going to make for their families, um, all those different ideas. So this really all started um, back in about 2012 um, when the science literacy cohort was hired. Um, and we realized pretty quickly that this is a big task. And so just last year, we decided to have more of a distributed leadership model for our team. Um, so Dean Tiffany Hang Moss is our administrative liaison, um, and our team is co-led by Kathleen Lodel and Mark Balshreet. Um, they also lead our efforts in the public sphere. So um, we have all these different areas within science literacy that we've broken up um, the, our efforts into. So public is one of them. Um, we also have a team working in higher education. So in just a little bit, I'm going to invite Jenny Dower up to talk about some of her work with Skill 101. Um, but Joe Dower um, leads those efforts. Um, the pre-K-12 space is really broad. There's just so many opportunities there to work with students in different capacities. Um, so we've broken up the, that sphere into two pieces. Um, Corey Forbes leads our formal K-12 education space, so working with teachers and professional development in those ways. And I lead our efforts in informal areas, so thinking about after school, 4-H, um, those types of areas, as well as I lead our partnerships. So this type of work takes us all. Like Mike mentioned at the beginning, this is not something that's specific to any one unit or department or topic area. It's really across campus, across um, the state, across a variety of different um, um, partners. So working with those different partners to bring that um, stronger within the science literacy efforts. So to date, what we've been able to accomplish, and this is just a really brief overview of some numbers that we can show you. 
Um, about 4,500 students have gone through the science literacy coursework as an undergrad here in Kasner, so it's a required course for all students, uh, which has been really cool to see. Um, as a team, we've been able to raise about $5 million in grant, grant support, so external funders um, thinking that work is important. 56 counties in the state of Nebraska have a Nebraska Extension educator that's really focused on science literacy. Um, and has identified that as one of their priority areas. We have two USDA funded REEU, so it's a research and extension experience for undergraduates um, on campus right now that both have an output related to science literacy. So Martha Mammal is one of those programs and I get to work with her, which is a lot of fun. And the students that go through that program at the end of their summer, they have this amazing research experience and then they translate that into a science literacy output. So maybe it's an infographic or a video or a lesson plan a teacher could use in their classroom. Um, and also, if you've noticed Activity Insight due a couple weeks ago, there's a little checkbox that you can mark and say something that you've done relates to science literacy. That in itself is really cool. Um, but as of 2017, I haven't seen the 2018 numbers yet, um, we had 700, over 700 times that checkbox was marked. So that doesn't mean 700 faculty members, that means 700 outputs, so maybe it was a um, program you ran or a paper you, put, you wrote or something like that um, that was identified as science literacy. So just a brief overview of science literacy and our progress in the past couple of years. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Dower, um, who will talk a little bit about science literacy in the undergraduate level. After Jenny speaks, um, I'm going to pass it over to Deepak and Luke Munholland, who are going to talk about some work at the K-12 level. Okay, I'm Jenny Dower, Assistant Professor in School of Natural Resources, and I'm happy to be here to talk to you about Science Literacy 101, or we abbreviate it as Skill 101. Um, so it's clear to me, and I think to all of us here, that there are a vast number of really unprecedented issues that students will have to make decisions about both personally and professionally sometime in the future. Um, and the uh, future will not fit into containers of the past. These are new and different kinds of things that, that students will be dealing with as adults um, or older adults. Um, and so the question is how do we prepare students for a future that contains these complex issues? Um, so I've been tasked with developing a classroom model to help develop and support student science literacy skills. But the question is, how do we operationalize that idea? What does that look like in a classroom? Um, and there's no preset theory or practice around that and what that looks like. Um, and so we've developed a model. And, and for me to talk about what that model looks like, I think it's helpful to compare and contrast two different models that explain people's decision making. Um, so one of the assumptions that underlies a lot of the traditional teaching that we do is that if we teach students science content knowledge, then they will make better decisions. Um, so a model might look like this one up here where um, knowledge that people have, uh, often this is called the deficit model. So if, if we could just remove that deficit and give people knowledge, that would change their attitudes, which would then influence their behavior and the decisions that they would make. But in reality, when you look at data around what predicts people's behavior and decision making, it's a lot, lot more complicated. And this is probably not surprising, right? So this is a model for pro-environmental behavior, but this could be a model that describes people beha people's behavior around technology or medicine or, or any host of things. Um, and so what scientists found um, by doing a review of a lot of, of research is that there are all kinds of internal factors that um, predict people's decision making. Some are conscious. Some are unconscious, like values and personality. Um, and there are external factors that play a role, like our social, political, economic landscape. And then there are uh, barriers, so things that are in black boxes here that um, keep people from making different kinds of decisions. Um, and so if you look at where knowledge is, you know, it's, it's a piece, <laughs> but it's not huge. Um, and, and so, um, <clears throat> Looking at things like this, it's clear to me that what we need to do with students is to not only just give them knowledge, but also help them think about how knowledge and science relates to values and how those knowledge and values play a role in the landscape of our world and the social, political, economic um, variables that people deal with in order to help students overcome barriers to making and forging a new kind of path. 
Um, and that idea is not just mine. Um, the idea that we need to do more than just teach science content knowledge is supported by the National Academies as well. Um, and so that brings us to Skill 101. And so we're hoping that Skill 101 is a model for um, science literacy instruction that can influence students here at UNL and beyond. Um, it's an introductory course that's required by all students in Kasner. So that's about 600 students a year. Um, and there are, I think it's 32 majors, is that right? 30? 30 different majors, I gotta fix that. Um, that are a mix of both STEM and non-STEM majors. Lots of different backgrounds and interests for the students in this class. And what we did is to foreground the practices around decision making, um, systems thinking, and information literacy. And we have students practice these skills over and over in the class. Um, and we, they practice these skills with um, different kinds of uh, socio-scientific issues as the backdrop. So for example, in the class, we've talked about uh, plastic pollution. We've talked about water conservation in agriculture, wildlife conservation, including wild pollinators and mountain lions. We've talked about energy and should we use corn ethanol as a biofuel. Um, and we're continuing to develop new modules all the time. We're thinking about modules around HPV vaccine or CRISPR technology or even football concussions. And I'll take suggestions if you have ideas. Um, and so when we talk to students about these different issues, we emphasize that there's no one right answer. They are complicated. Um, and um, when it's really important, issue, when the issues are really important like these, and it's important that we don't make a mistake, we need to slow down and make a good decision that's deliberate and objective, and to use some kind of tool for decision making to reduce the cognitive biases that everyone has. Um, and, and so we also talked to them about what is a good decision. So if we're trying to improve decision making, what does that really mean? Um, and so <clears throat> we've defined what a good decision is based on uh, decision sciences literature. And often that decision, a good decision, depends on the quality of the process by which it's made. Um, and we talked to the students about how a good decision is when uh, that uh, displays the ability of a decision maker to interpret and apply scientific information to think about what are the consequences of different alternatives for solving a problem. So that's what science does for us. It helps us think about consequences in the future and, and predict what's going to happen in the future um, if we do different things. And secondly, the final choice should reflect priorities that result from an evaluation of trade-offs. So we talked to students about making, you know, thinking about trade-offs and not just making decisions based on shortcuts or heuristics like for example, what is the cheapest thing isn't always the best choice, right? So, um, so these two things are part of the learning goals for students around decision making and also the focus of research that we're doing in the class to see if we're developing these skills in the students as a result of the course. Um, and so this is the structured decision making framework that we use for each of the issues that we cover in the class. Um, so we have students think about multiple options for solving any of these big socio-scientific issues. They think about criteria, like what do they value in an outcome, and they have multiple criteria that they analyze. And then we spend a lot of, of time on step four, where students are doing specific research on if we do option one, will we achieve the thing that we want in criteria one? Um, and so a lot of the uh, course is having the students find really specific um, technical scientific information from peer review literature. Um, and then they do a trade-off analysis that's semi-quantitative to figure out which option would satisfy their unique set of trade-offs that they prioritize. Um, and I could talk to you forever about the research that we're doing in the class, but I won't, obviously. But I wanted to highlight one thing. Um, my PhD student, Sitlali Jimenez, who you see here, has been finding um, some, I think, really interesting results in that we're seeing that students are, as a result of the course, writing arguments that are more supported by science evidence. So they're writing arguments that aren't just assumptions, but are um, reasoning about specific things that they have science to support, which I think is really exciting. And we're finding lots of other things also um, that I won't talk about. But um, the last thing I will say too is that um, with any large enrollment required course that students have to take, it's often very, very difficult to get students on your side and to enjoy the course um, and to be excited about it. But we are, over time, especially as the course evolves, um, seeing that students are appreciating it and valuing the course. So here are some quotes from last fall's student evaluations um, that are some selected positive quotes. <laughs> 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 so we're working on that part. Um, and so 
I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the other instructors who have taught the course in the past or, or who will in the future and the tons of learning assistants that make the course actually work um, and the research team. So thank you for the time. Mm -hmm. So my name is Deepak Keshwani, I'm a faculty member in biological systems engineering and um, uh, on behalf of J.M. Sabaya and a really large team that he put together, I uh, wanted to uh, kind of give you an update on a project that we affectionately call Apocalypse 2050, but really it's got a much larger title that's boring, Immersive Educational Game Simulations to Enhance Understanding of Corn, Water, Ethanol, Beef Systems. I actually prefer Apocalypse 2050, but so what is Apocalypse 2050? Well, we responded as a team to this call from NSF for the Infuse uh, area, and our idea was could we use authentic research-based models, integrate them, and use that to actually develop an immersive video game that can help uh, youth, we're targeting middle and high school students, to um, have achieve outcomes in the areas of sustainability, agricultural literacy, STEM career awareness, and systems thinking. And it was very important for us to think about using and retaining authentic research models because a lot of educational games try to simplify, make assumptions that often doesn't do the science justice. And so for us, it was really important to actually use validated research models that researchers use today to sort of drive the uh, educational activities. And so as you can imagine, looking at, we chose to use the corn, water, ethanol, beef system um, that we see here in Nebraska as the basis. And in order to do that, uh, we had to obviously engage with a large group of people, some of you in the room. So we have folks from agronomy, engineering, uh, the School of Natural Resources, uh, ag economics, the College of Business downtown, uh, experts in education and assessment. Uh, we also engaged with folks in College of Far Fine and Performing Arts to look at the graphics elements of that and uh, to try to put something together that would not only be um, research-based but also appealing and interesting for the end user. Um, and one of the key ideas, uh, unique things about this project was just the sheer number of students that were involved. Uh, for a large project like this, we do not have even a PhD student or postdoc. It was really largely driven by master's students and a team of undergraduate students, right? And we had several students come in and out. We even had high, high school students involved in the project, right, in different pieces, doing research, doing the graphics and the education. We also engaged with the uh, Rake senior design team to help with some of the early software development for the game. And so it was really interesting to see these students sort of, we've already had two students that have graduated now, uh, supported by this project. Uh, and we've got a third graduate student working on the grant right now. And they've really embraced this idea of working as a team. And it's really interesting to see st these graduate students supervising and leading this team of undergraduate students. And they really treat this like a software development project, a company, right? They have team meetings, they have releases, and they're constantly engaging. They're taking the initiative to go out and seek the expert. Who's the expert that we need to learn more about integrating a certain type of weather model? Right? They're going out there, they're seeking that expert out, figuring out a way to integrate that into the educational uh, activity. Uh, so as an educator, we all like to identify those moments where you start to see some real interesting things happen in the classroom. So I want to share this one moment where very early on in the project, we had worked with Colleen Siren in the uh, College of Fine and Performing Arts. She teaches a graphics design course. And we had asked her to think about some concept art for the game. And so one of the things she asked for is, is like, I want my students who don't know a lot about agriculture and what it's like to live in rural America to try to understand that as they build this concept art out. So we took a bunch of our Kasner students, right, into their classroom, and it was just amazing to watch that. We didn't have to do anything. You had this great back and forth interaction. We talk about like bringing people together to learn about each other's, where they're from, the backgrounds, and try to promote discourse. This happened organically due to the project. It was one of those moments that really, as an educator, you're really proud of, and you want to see more of these. Um, so while this graphic stuff is being developed, we also had to simultaneously figure out, how do we actually do this, right? We've got all these research models out there. How do we actually make them work so that it communicates with a video game, right? So while that was going on, we had a bunch of grad students actually working on the research aspects of integrating these models through a web-based framework. And so, um, so that was kind of an interesting uh, product from the grant where as we were getting all these educational outcomes, these outputs, we were also getting some research scholarly outputs and actually building this integrated model. Speaking of which, I will now turn it over to 
Luke Munholland, who's one of our graduate students, uh, working on the grant, and he's going to walk through kind of an overview of the game as we have it today. Hello, everyone. Um, to make sure that this demonstration goes over very easily, we produced a video of actually having one of our other programmers demo the game, and I'm just going to be talking over top of it. So you can just stare at that if you want to. <laughs> so I want to reiterate that this we're using actual models. These are models that are used in the professional workplace by people in these areas. And each one of these models was developed on its own, isolated from everything else. And we have combined these into a single, cohesive, loosely coupled framework that allows students to interface with that within a story that we've produced for Agpocalypse, which is where they have to make sustainable decisions. But where do you even start with this? So we have students first pick a location. And this is a big deal. Actually, a lot of students were interested in picking their county and actually complained that their county wasn't included. We're currently getting the rest of the counties added into the system. But in these, they have soil profiles. They have um, ec uh, economic decisions that are baked into them um, and weather profiles. And then we've also given them a nucleus fund to essentially produce a small farm uh, in that location. And everything in this is effectively changeable by the, uh, by the user. So based on what um, piece of farm equipment they purchase, based on um, how long it's been running, we can change the aspects of this so they can see as they are functioning as a farmer in this area, what are, are their decisions doing? And what I'm saying about decisions, what decisions are they making? Well, they're going to be purchasing corn to actually plant. They're going to be purchasing fertilizer, chemicals to spray if they need, if they need to due to disease. Um, they also make decisions on, as I said, the equipment that they're actually using for this. If they select a higher tier equipment, then maybe it has more running hours. Then they're going to be making decisions on when do I irrigate? When do I fertilize? Do I do it in multiple small iterations or do I do uh, several just large um, uh, allotments at once? And these will change how the model reacts. And so we've effectively made an a interface for students to enjoy playing with these models. And again, it changes. Based on their decisions, they can see the corn grow, produce a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of corn in this case, um, or they can see it die because they made poor decisions. And they also have an inventory that brings back into everything that they are working with sustain, uh, with sustainability here, it's, it's all in one spot. They get to see what the soil's doing um, and also what their budget's doing. And this kind of comes into the next piece that is kind of often missed in a lot of sustainability, economics. And this is where we actually created a small AI, very rudimentary, that they have to play against, in this case, in the cattle auction. So they have to decide, is it better to buy cattle at a expensive price that maybe is not the right economic decision, but is it more sustainable so that you can actually use DGS and uh, offset um, the ethanol production process, how much greenhouse gases are allotted to, to ethanol, or vice versa? Is it better to actually lower the sustainability so that you can actually have the economic bump? They have to make that decision within these models. And this is where this coupled model allows students to see these interconnections. They can see how their decisions affect other ones within the system. And this is not really provided in many other games. Uh, with this, we've also created multiple educational scenarios that can target essentially one hour at a time at one facet of these interconnected models to allow students and faculty and uh, teachers to really dig into a certain piece of each one of these. And I would like to definitely reiterate again that they are changing the area around them in the game. Now that seems like why am I doing that? A lot of students mentioned that they enjoyed seeing their decisions make a difference. And what we're doing is not amplifying them showing uh, six times the amount of greenhouse gas per uh, uh, gallon of gasoline it's actually how their decisions modify it by selecting a new feedlot or using pasture only. What does that change to the decisions? What does that change for their ability to be sustainable and economically viable? And with that, I'm going to give it back to Dr. Kishwani. 
So we've actually uh, utilized versions and modules of this game already, both in the college, high school audience, but uh, we've also done it with uh, in the 4-H uh, community as well. And you can see that it really is an immer uh, uh, a very attractive and immersive environment to engage students with. So we're looking forward to some more outputs from this. Uh, you know, when you think about putting students like Luke in a room, you never know what they're going to come up with. So one of our graduate students, Nathan, who's just now working actually for Nebraska Extension, he had this idea of, you know, we've got all this information. Video game is great. Let's be able, go ahead and build a board game as well. So the students came up with preservation, which you can buy online, gamecrafter.com, to search for preservation. And it really is, takes a lot of these pieces of information that are embedded in the video game, and we created a cooperative board game that kind of introduces the corn, water, ethanol, beef system. It talks about system interactions, and students play collectively to understand how decision making occurs and how does that affect uh, the environment. So. Um, We've demoed this as well, both in, again, the high, uh, college uh, classroom as well as with uh, youth around uh, to try to capture what value is, is this, this type of approach give um, to uh, achieving those outcomes for the project. I want to kind of end back on this slide here because I want to emphasize that one of the values behind this project was really uh, using authentic research-based models. And um, the importance of that is just imagine that Apocalypse 2050 is now replaced by a policy tool for decision makers, right? Can we utilize this framework to answer questions like, what is the ability for Nebraska to produce a certain amount of corn or beef in 2035 with this type of weather scena climate scenario and these type of constraints, financial constraints? is that's a question that we can answer, and that's kind of where we're hoping to go. So if you see a role from your discipline and you want to engage with us as a team, join us, just contact uh, J.M. Sabaya, me, or any one of our team members. We'll be glad to reach out and see how we can connect, because our team is growing. This is a living and breathing project, so we're looking forward to that. So with that, I'll turn it back to Jenny. So I hope you see a common thread through those projects of the idea of decision making, systems thinking, these complex um, societal issues that we're trying to help um, people be prepared to answer and really is um, the core of the science literacy initiative. So just a, another way to kind of look at this, and this is a kind of scary slide, but I like it because it, <laughs> it shows a lot of what we've been able to do in the past five, six years and all the partners that we've gained, all the different teams and projects and people that are involved with this and I could spend an hour talking about all those little pictures, so I won't do that. Um, but where are we going next? A um, couple goals that we have for our team. One is just that every student in Nebraska would have at least one science literacy experience throughout their um, education. So this kind of continuum of learners that we'd be able to impact that in some way. And when we think about the 56 counties that already have an educator that's really focused on science literacy, I don't think this is that hard to pull off. So I'm um, really looking to, to find ways to make that happen. Um, again, to expand these collaborations and partnerships that we already have developed. Um, there's always room for more people to be involved. These are really, really broad um, challenges and issues and ideas, and we need everybody to be part of the discussion. Um, and finally, this is kind of my dream. I think it'd be really cool if every relevant discovery made on campus, so say you're a researcher and you make some new discovery or come up with a new innovation, if that was somehow vetted in a way that we identified who the audience for that innovation was and then we could make that, package it into a way that made sense for that audience to receive that information, I think that would be amazing. So we ha we're in the early stages of looking at some ideas around that, so um, we'll see what, what comes out with that. So if you're interested, we'd love to have you join um, our efforts. Our science, liter science literacy community meeting is next Thursday at 11 a.m. I forgot to put the time on there. Mm -hmm. 11 a.m. in the Arbor Suite upstairs. So hope you're able to join us. Thanks for the, the time to share a little bit about our work, Mike. Right on time, Jenny. You can take oh, that and okay. give it to, to Brian. Let's give that team uh, a round of applause. When I heard them uh, share with Ronnie uh, on the 11th, it was just so impactful, and I, I, it crossed the entirety of what we do here. So I appreciate hearing that. I appreciate Luke. Um, 
Luke's, uh, Luke has been uh, sharing with a lot of groups, so thank you, Luke, as a student engaged in this. I do want to use this slide to jump off and say that um, we have been actively engaged. Um, you have been, before I got here, actively engaged in our six communities. But since I've gotten here, we've had a number of really critical conversations. Uh, on April 13, 2017, we hosted what was called the Science Summit. We had 120 people coming together to really think about um, reigniting, um, doubling down in our six community conversation. That led to a rekindling of broad conversations amongst the six communities. That led to November 8, 2017, where we had something called the um, Growing Nebraska Summit. It was held at the Husker, uh, Cornhusker Marriott. We had 450 people from 73 counties, 54 cities, coming to listen to you, talking about what we're doing and exploring through roundtables. Um, that led to a series of conversations that culminated last year in July in Nebraska City. Uh, 81 uh, of the leaders across, uh, across all three mission areas really coming together and unpacking and exploring where those communities are. Uh, Larry Van Tassel uh, quote there, we uh, for the first time invited the leads of the 18 issues teams in, in extension to join us. And we heard comments like, and Larry's quote was something along the lines, this was the most impactful 30 minute conversation that we've ever had by opening up to a more diverse audience. Uh, that led to a series of informed conversations with center directors and unit leaders and, and teams to identify new uh, faculty lines, both non-tenure track and tenure track, and we've talked about those, um, which then led us to an opportunity to share with Ronnie, which is now leading us to an invitation to all faculty, uh, all staff that are interested in these six areas to these open fora to talk about where we are, where we're going, and where we want to go. And all of this then gets bundled up with the hope of harmonizing with the N150 planning for IENR to come up by this summer with our draft reaffirmed high-level strategic vision of where the Institute's going. This is definitely a team sport, but I wanted to share that with you. Okay, so we've talked a lot about momentum. Every time I get to visit with you, the momentum is palpable, it's real, and IENR is really moving the needle. Um, I, I want to uh, share a little bit. Uh, I say all the time, it's our people. Uh, so I want to uh, introduce you to our newest faculty, uh, tenure track and non-tenure track faculty. We continue to attract the best and brightest minds from all over the world. And uh, I, it's exciting uh, to, to get to know these, these folks. I also would invite um, all of the, our new staff. Uh, the list was very long. Um, but if you're a new staff member uh, hired since September, would you mind standing so that we can uh, welcome you? Don't be shy, please. Yep, Kirsten, thank you. <laughs> welcome. I say this all the time, um, we really are a community of, of students, staff, faculty, alumni, uh, stakeholders, and um, we wouldn't get anything done without our, our staff, our long-term staff, oh, nearly 1,200 strong across the institute in all corners, and so thank you. Uh, I do want to recognize Tiffany Hang Moss. If you'd stand up, come on, stand up, please. Let's give her a big round of applause. What a treat, we had a national search. Tiffany was the candidate of choice. I wanna thank again uh, our whole community. That was a big endeavor to, uh, to bring Tiffany here. Uh, we have a new department chair in entomology, John Ruberson. John, I don't see, we've probably zooming in. Um, Cindy, Cindy is our new lead for the Metro uh, District. And Jesse Brophy, Jesse's here. Uh, Jesse is not a new face, but Jesse assumed a new role. Uh, we had, uh, since the departure of Jill Brown, we've been thinking about how do we think about special events and how do we think about the role Jill was doing. 
and it was a wonderful opportunity for about 11 months to see a lot of people shine. And so we repackaged uh, Jesse's job and really blended what Jesse was doing with what Jill was doing. And um, Jesse's big new exciting role, she's our lead uh, liaison with the unicameral. So she's learning on the job uh, as we go. Um, Ronnie Green, we talked about uh, Ronnie and the N150 on, uh, earlier this month. Um, big, big celebration that continues. And uh, really, it started before the State of the University address. If you've not listened or read Ronnie's comments, um, I, I really encourage you to go and, and take a look. Uh, I thought it was an, uh, inspiring. Uh, he did a nice job on some history, pretty much looked back six generations, and thought about what was happening in 25-year gulps at UNL and then really was um, a projection about the next six generations and our role um, in that. And so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, what spoke to me in the uh, N150 uh, report, which was put together by 165 uh, folks, different voices, uh, several in the room were involved with that, uh, several were leading, such as Chuck Hibbard leading our outreach and engagement bit. But, here are four aspirations, and I think it's important to, to run through these. Nebraska students co-create their experience. Our research and creativity transforms lives and learning. Every person and every interaction matters. Engagement builds communities. So these aren't strategic goals but their aspirational, core aspirational goals of when people think about UNL, these are the things that we want people to say, yeah, that's exactly right. And of course, I think uh, and, and really believe this, that IANR embodies these core aspiration, aspirations and that we have been continuing to build and grow through our programming efforts. I do want to encourage you. Um, the week, Charter Week, that's what it's uh, being called, February 11th through the 15th. Every day of Charter Week, there is something going on, and uh, pretty exciting. Some big things, some small things, speakers, all kinds of nifty things going on, and there's a website there that you can go. Um, kind of clever, I think, maybe, maybe a little hokey. Uh, glow Big Red, um, so every building, the the state house is going to be glowing big red. Um, it's going to be pretty good. I think uh, it plays right on Valentine's Day, so I guess we can wonder why they're painting the, the, uh, the tower red. But uh, it'll be exciting and just a lot of neat uh, opportunities that week, and I'd encourage you. And these opportunities are going to stretch the whole year. And um, we'll be having activities on our campus uh, uh, here on East Campus and across Nebraska. There will be a traveling uh, display. It'll launch uh, on campus during this week, and then it will be displayed for three weeks, perfectly timed for the unicameral to get a strong dose of the importance of the University of Nebraska, and then it's going on the road. Its first stop will be O'Neill, and it will be making its way across. It will stop here um, so just, I encourage you to go take a look at that. Related to Ronnie's 150th address, going back to even before I started, there were six task forces that were initiated uh, by the chancellor to really dive in. And one of those task forces was something around our uh, exploring our budget system. Uh, we have what I would refer to as a legacy budget. Um, it's looking at what units were uh, had in their portfolio last year, Paul, and then maybe if we have more resources, we plus it up. If we don't have resources, we minus it down, and, uh, and that's it. About 40% of the universities in America have switched, starting in about 2002, to something called a Responsibility-Centered Management, or RCM, budget model. And these RCM models are complicated, and, uh, and there's a lot of pros in there, a lot of cons. 
And if you do it right, there are wonderful outcomes. If you do it wrong, you slip into, into tricky spaces. And so um, this group, this task force, and I, this will all be online so you can click and link, but they provided some input and recommendations to Ronnie, and the recommendation was, let's not go whole hog RCM model, but we can't stay where we're at in order to uh, align our resources, our people, our space, our financial resources smartly, let's, let's think about a hybrid model. Ronnie is putting, and this is, uh, this is before the public announcement, but next week, um, early next week, uh, Ronnie will be announcing a working group that will be uh, actually unpacking and thinking about how an RCM model might work here at the University of Nebraska. IANR is well represented on this in partnership with our colleagues across the system. The second thing that uh, task force, if you will, that Ronnie is launching that you'll see here in the next uh, coming weeks is a team to look at our business and HR processes, uh, our model of operation. Uh, I love the slide, Jenny Dower, that you showed about the barriers um, the bureaucracies, Governor Ricketts did something in state government. Uh, we have layer upon layer upon layer of initiation and approval and policy for this and policy for that. And the question is, can we remove some of those barriers, streamline some processes, get people to play towards their strengths that really enhance our opportunity to fulfill our mission? And so that is another group that's going to work. Uh, those two committees or two groups are going to work in parallel because they really do, they do, they fit together with the idea of some clarity coming out on the other side of this um, somewhere in the middle of uh, August. At the same time, Ronnie will be uh, creating a faculty led committee. It'll be co-led by four faculty. It'll have administrators, students, faculty, staff, really looking at how do we take those core aspirational goals in the 150 report and move them into action. And all of that's going to converge on or about the 15th of August. And then it will be openly vetted with the idea that by Charter Week or the State of the University Address in 2020, seemed like a long way away, but it's only 11 months, Will, will be set. And it's that framework then that IANR is continuing its strategic road mapping and everything we've been doing um, is, is going, for the last two years, is going to culminate in a nice harmonized IANR uh, strategic road map that fits really nice hand in glove with, uh, with the university. Okay, just a, a quick run through. Uh, I don't know about Chuck, his body was saying it's cold in here. Holy smokes, the bald guy in the corner was shivering over there. It's cold. Uh, I was reminded that the wall, when you walked in, that you see that drywall, folks, that is the barrier from outside to in. So um, it's pretty chilly uh, and it's gonna, it's gonna be uh, in this building it's going to be, um, it's going to take us a little time. Let me go to my question that I didn't get to this morning. Uh, my question was, can you please speak to the little daily annoyances that can add up fast? Driving, parking, heating, and cooling. Another part of this question, will parking be added for buildings that currently lack abundant close parking? And I really do, um, that question had some color commentary about the, the vice chancellor doesn't really appreciate what we're talking about because he has a nice, cozy, close, close parking spot. Um, and, and yes, that's true. Um, and uh, I guess I very much appreciate that. And those that live in my neighborhood know that I, just like every other citizen of, of Lincoln, I park far away from the grocery store or on city campus. So uh, I'm with you. It is, it's an important uh, part of the job, um, but I appreciate the color commentary and I appreciate being in a place where people speak their mind. Uh, that was an anonymous comment I will, I will share, <laughs> and that's okay. I, uh, will the campus exit south of 
College of Dentistry at the intersection of 40th and Holdridge Streets be reopened? And then this one, can we turn up the heat? <laughs> if you know, even in Ag Hall, I wear a sweater every, every day because I shiver uh, if I don't, um, or I open up my door and steal somebody else's heat. Um, these all seem like small things, but they're not, and uh, we hear about them. Let me talk a little bit about parts and pieces. I should have also mentioned that the questions, the ones we answered uh, orally, and the ones that we didn't get to, we're writing cogent responses, and those will be made available so that everyone can see the questions and everyone can see our responses. So thanks again for those questions. Um, so a little bit about uh, the campus. Uh, we are, uh, master planning had happened quite some time ago um, before. I think we're getting close to having another master, master planning exercise. East, west, north, south, pedestrian corridors are definitely part of the conversation. Our friends in the Barclay Center, they, they, they don't even have sidewalks to walk safely. Our friends in the College of Dentistry live a, surrounded by a concrete moat. Um, and, and while it's not like crossing Holdridge, playing Frogger, it is, it's tricky. Um, we have very much thought about moving parking um, out of the center of the core so that we have more green spaces, uh, thinking about adjacencies, uh, thinking about how, um, in fact, our dairy store was the number one Nebraska passport location last year. Uh, how do we bring people into campus? How do we get them close to the buildings? Um, that's a constant battle, uh, no question about it. The Holdridge um, South Exit, um, that, that is a complicated project that's uh, run far, far more than by the East Campus. Um, part of that is thinking about safety. If you drive in on that uh, side of the, the way, um, I think they're moving towards putting another lit crosswalk such that students who live in that neighborhood, especially with dentistry and with Barclay and law, can cross uh, safely, much like the one here uh, over by Cultiva, so forth and so on. So there's some work in that space. As far as um, getting parking up close and personal to buildings, I think that's just a constant battle. Um, and heating and cooling, uh, this renovation, to be honest with you, is half, more than half of this renovation is all around redoing heating and cooling and fire suppression systems. A lot of our buildings are old buildings. I would just say from personal experience, I think we do a better job here than my former institution on deferred maintenance, but I still know that it is uncomfortable sometimes, and um, especially when those calls go unheard. I think if you uh, are frustrated in that way, make sure that your unit leaders know, and the unit leaders should be in contact with um, uh, us in central uh, administration. and. And uh, I walk enough around, and Ron walks enough around, Barry walks enough around that we should be able to, to help you out there. But uh, if you're having to wear a, a toboggan, a hat, a beanie, whatever you call it, wear gloves in your office, uh, that's a problem. Sometimes even the noise uh, is, is overly loud. So um, I appreciate sharing that. We're moving things along uh, just here in the stretch, the Christensen building. I talked with Doug, uh, it's, I, I visited it in December, uh, had a leak, brand new building with a leak. Some of the flashing was not, not done right. So um, we're just waiting for the furniture and we expect to have occupancy there. This is a big deal at, at NREC. Uh, of course, this building, this building is, we say renovation, it's being transformed. Um, we're keeping the building open. Uh, those of you who've been trying to have meetings on the third floor have enjoyed the jackhammering and the noise and you wonder if somebody's coming through the ceiling. Um, but this building's moving along. The dining, the dining hall will be open this fall for fall semester. Uh, you can't see in anymore, but they're uh, putting all the, the plumbing and the electrical conduits for the new kitchen. So that's, that's coming along. Uh, when that opens up, the second floor that we're on closes. Um, the third floor will still be open. I'm still trying to figure out how we get people to the third floor when the second floor is closed. If you take a look out here, lots and lots of concrete and steel work going on. The new front door, the new front door will on the south, 
um, is, is being worked on. The C.Y. Thompson transformation, that library will be uh, closed uh, sometime this summer before fall semester. We're going to recreate the uh, library and the circulation desk uh, over in the old food processing or food industry building. In order to make that happen, a decision was made. You've all read about it. The dairy store is not going away. Uh, it is getting a, a move in the building or a shift in the building. It will be moved, and if you've looked, you now know that what used to be these little windows in the food industry building have been replaced with full length windows and you can see in and you can see out. The dairy store will be on, on what we've been calling Legacy Plaza. We've been working with Kim Todd students. They are referring to this green space as the meadow. So it's the meadow at Legacy Plaza. <laughs> and uh, it's really neat space. Uh, you can actually eat your ice cream and look out. You can see the new union. Um, you can see the new CYT. You can look over and see Massengale. You can see the little Ruth Staples kids were all playing out here one day. It's just really our attempt to activate this green space um, as we've been talking about. And then over in the Life Science Annex, which sits between Morrison and um, Life Science and the VDC, we received the five million three gifts that totaled five million to uh, double our germ-free mouse facility or animal handling facility that this new space will be in service to the Food for Health Center to humanize mice with prebiotics and, and probiotics and microflora that um, bring out health outcomes. So it's pretty exciting and that was all privately fundraised. Just a little bit about public and private partnerships. You've Every, every time I, I visit with you, I talk about these. I want to talk about one that is really quite exciting. This was uh, a national competition to land the home of a new National Institute for Antimicrobial Resistance Research and Education. It's a long acronym, NAMARI. Um, we, we won the bid. Uh, we didn't do it alone. We partnered with our Med Center colleagues. We partnered with the University of Iowa's Med Center. We partnered with Iowa State's colleges of Vet Med and Ag, um, and then with the Mayo Clinic. That was uh, one of nine teams that put in a, to a national competition. Just to give you a little flavor, Cornell submitted, UC Davis submitted, Georgia submitted, North Carolina State, Florida, Illinois, I like this one, Ohio State, and we were selected. And so uh, this is a big deal, uh, antimicrobial resistance in food animal production, in human medicine, in cropping systems, uh, and through that, even though it's a different mechanism, through uh, herbicide resistance, omit, through uh, insecticide resistance, this is a big deal, and uh, for us to land this is pretty exciting. We're continuing our conversations with uh, corporate or industry partners. Um, this is continuing all in service to filling blind spots, developing synergies that help us move our mission area forward. Um, these are the four groups that we've been uh, discussing. Um, the CUPE team is headquartered in Tokyo, so that's required some trips. QP owns Henningsen Foods, they're the parent company, and we have four locations of Henningsen Foods here. Costco, we've talked a lot about Costco. We have conversations right now with our poultry team about Costco actually building poultry production, teaching, research, and education uh, at, uh, barns at NREC. That would work by us leasing them the land for 12 to 18 months, they do all the capital investment, the lease is over, the ownership reverts to us, and we have a place to engage. Microsoft brought 15 of their leadership team, two vice presidents, to campus. They came in on Monday night last week. They were here for our snow day, and they left on Monday. Really thinking about how we can leverage Microsoft's platforms in artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, large data computing, 
but also Microsoft is connected in in so many ways, not only through their Microsoft uh, product line, but also with social, uh, social uh, change. And it fits nicely with, with what we're doing. Stand by on, on this one. Okay, on the budget, I want to talk just a little bit here in the, the waning minutes that I have. I will just say that I feel like we're starting from the best possible place since I've been a Nebraskan. Um, lots of positives. Uh, just kind of giving you a little bit back in here in September. Um, I talked to you about the Board of Regents giving President Bounds the authority to raise tuition if in fact he felt it was necessary to respond to yet another mid-year rescission. The good news is there is going to be no mid-year rescission. There is no need then for a mid-year tuition increase. Um, government, uh, the, uh, if you kind of scroll through here, the government shutdown in December that uh, lasted historic, historically a, a long uh, shutdown. Um, other things, we started as a state collecting online sales tax, which adds some relief to the tax uh, conversation. The unicameral has got up and running, unlike my first 90-day session where it took them 35 days to go through their rules. They are already having public hearings. They're moving things along. Um, the governor released his state budget, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the federal shutdown ends. And then Jen and I think we should end ends-ish. Um, we'll see what happens, but if you were watching the papers, it was, you know, the people who were most impacted were the federal workers who were required to go to work, who weren't getting paychecks, who are going to uh, food pantries, really tricky stuff. It was starting to hit even at the university level. And uh, thankfully, this little reprieve has allowed more money to flow out of the federal government. And hopefully, they get an answer. Some things to keep an eye on. The forecasting board meets on February 28th. This is when the forecasting board is going to say, here's what the future economy looks like. Jen and I, again, must have had too much caffeine. But she says, man, it's a little like Groundhog's Day. If the forecasting board gets together on the 28th and, uh, and, and things are looking good, then the budget process will be a little smoother. If they pop their head up and the forecast looks gloomy, then we're, we're, we're going to be in for a rough, a rough run. So we'll see, what, um, we'll see what the groundhogs do on the 2nd of February. Uh, the other thing I want to put in there is March 4th, President Bounds will be in front of the unicameral uh, appropriations committee making the case for our budget. So these are really tiny, so you'll see it, but the, the net net here is that uh, the University of Nebraska in this upcoming biennial budget requested a 3% increase for this next year that starts on July 1 and a 3.7% increase for the following year. The governor's budget came in and uh, essentially was 2.7% um, uh, for next year and 3.4, not 3.7 for the out year. So when you sum it all up and net it out, and I want to make a point that Hank would make, President Bounds, this was a, this was a very streamlined, nuts and bolts, austere budget that we, the Board of Regents, put forward. So it wasn't a lot of, uh, wasn't a lot of extra. It was just get us through. If you take a look at these two lines, essentially um, the budget, budget from the governor provided uh, salary and benefit funds that were requested. The governor's budget was zeroed out for all of the other operating costs, utility costs, so forth. The net net is that um, we were 4.9 million short in what we, what we had hoped we'd get. Again, folks, this is the starting point, so hopefully we can move positively from, from here. Okay, and then um, just lastly, I think I've kind of covered this. There was, that que there was a question, there were two questions. Uh, what is INR doing in terms of 
responding to the N-150 report and making sure we're in a position to have a strategic roadmap set out. I've kind of covered that. And then um, the other question was, hey, if you were to think about 10 to 15 years, what's your vision of IANR? Well, uh, I'm going to go back to three slides. One, I've already shared this with you. The core aspirations, uh, I think this is who we are. Uh, we embody these, so there's no misalignment. I come right back to what we're doing already and the importance of our six communities and the journey that we began in 2010, 2011, and where we're at. These are the things that we have said matter. These are the things that we have said we believe we can make a positive impact on humanity. And so we're going to keep driving forward and putting resources in these areas. I shared this the very first time I visited with you, two years almost to the day, that uh, when we think about um, what we do in IENR, we think about our organizational structure. The most important part of this is our people, our students, our staff, our faculty, and the citizens of Nebraska, and in fact, the globe. And that's the top, and everything else is moving to help uh, move the needle and draw and drive impacts. And so I just want to remind us of that. I shared this in uh, my second uh, visit with you really by focusing on the success of people and really by thinking of uh, how we can be more accessible, how we can be more inclusive, um, how we can be more engaged and through these kinds of authentic partnerships that start with each of us so that you can say what's on your mind and be heard dignity and difference with respect. And I thought Chuck Hagel and Bob Carey did an amazing job at the Huerman Lecture last fall talking about difference with, and with dignity. We really are poised to continue making differences that matter here locally and beyond. And then I leave you with this quote from a book that was published in, in 2014 called The Modern Land Grant. And I'll just read it. Land Grant Institutions contrary to some popular beliefs, are not merely about agricultural development, but rather about changing the world in a positive, meaningful, and enduring way. Land-grant institutions perhaps best represent the very core of what greatness means in American society, namely equal opportunity for all, and through it, the chance to make our society and the world a better place in which to live. And I think that sums it up. And uh, I'm proud to be a part of IANR. Uh, thanks for your patience as we explore a different, uh, a different uh, approach today. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting in the car and heading over to Clay Center this afternoon, where it's a balmy 23, and then spend the night over in North Platte, um, visiting with our colleagues tomorrow at West Central and down in Curtis where tomorrow it'll be 50 degrees over there. So um, thank you very much for all you do, and uh, we'll see you around campus.